Hey guys, Will here. So if you've been watching our racing videos of late on the channel, you would have seen this wheel. This is the Gomez Sim Industries Formula Pro Elite, and it is definitely one of the most visually striking bits of sim racing equipment that we've reviewed to date here at the channel. But looks definitely aren't everything, especially when it comes to a wheel that costs as much as this one does. So today we're gonna to be unpacking it, going through all the details that you need to know about this wheel to decide whether this is the wheel for you. Let's get started. So to begin with some important information just to make sure that you guys have the full picture and context here. Firstly, big thank you to Gomez Sim Industries for sending across this wheel for us to check out today. Now, as is always the case here at Boosted Media, they don't get to see the review before it goes live. They have absolutely zero creative control whatsoever. Everything that we're gonna be talking about today is purely our own observations and opinions based on about two months now that I've been using this wheel. Now, just so you guys know as well, we don't have any sort of affiliate relationship with Gomez directly, but we do have some affiliate research seller partners, which we have listed down in the description below, as well as on our website, boostedmedia.net. Now, one of the really cool things about this particular wheel is that you do have the option to completely customize the appearance from the button colors, the sticker colors, the text on the stickers themselves, all kinds of things that you can do to make this your own. Now, if you do decide that you really like what we've done with this particular design, our affiliate partner, Advanced Sim Racing, do actually have a bit of stock of this exact configuration as you see it here. So if you decide you like exactly what we've done and you want to pick one of those up, the link is down in the description below. Now we will also be making some comparisons between this wheel and some of the others that you see behind me. It's important that you guys know that those have also been provided by their respective manufacturers. And as is always the case, if you do want to pick up any of the gear that you see in today's video, our affiliate links are an awesome way of helping support the channel at no additional cost to you. So we really do appreciate your support there. But let's dive into the Formula Pro Elite now. So the base price for this guy is 1,250 US dollars. As you see configured here it's a little bit more expensive than that so we have the dual clutch option you can see the two clutch paddles on the back here. Those add $187 to the price. You'll also notice on the back here, we have the AH50 spacer, which is an accessory from Gomez as well. So that's a 50 millimeter spacer. Now it isn't absolutely necessary to purchase this. It will depend on the quick release that you're mounting on your wheel. It has a standard 70 millimeter stud pattern on the back here. So provided that you have the clearance to your wheelbase, you may or may not need to buy that. Just be aware that the connector, as we'll see in a minute, does take up quite a bit of space there. So just consider that when you're purchasing, you may wanna have that spacer just to make sure you've got enough clearance to your wheelbase so the cable isn't bashing against it constantly. So as configured right here, the total price, including the hub, which is 78 US dollars, comes in at 1,515 US dollars. So it definitely isn't a cheap wheel, but it does certainly bring a lot to the table when it comes to the sim racing experience. So let's unpack all of the various features that we have on this wheel. Start with the obvious things. So we have 10 push buttons around the face of the wheel. We've got five rotary encoders also with push button functionality. We've got a seven way funky switch here. So up, down, left, right, rotary encoder to the right, rotary encoder to the left and push button. And then if we flip the wheel around again, you can see on the back, we've got two magnetic shifters and then two analog paddles. And those do have a bite point clutch function as well. Now we'll spin back around to the front here. We have a 16 RGB LED array, which can be programmed to do pretty much anything you can imagine from rev lights to flags, even a spotter if you want to do so. This is all completely programmable using third party software as we'll see later on. And then there's also a 4.3 inch touchscreen Vocore 800 by 480 resolution display built into the wheel too. And that is going to make up a big part of today's review, digging in and showing you exactly what we can do with that display. So the diameter as quoted by them is 310 millimeters. So definitely on the larger style for a formula style wheel as is this one. We actually measured this to be closer to 320 millimeters at the widest point. So just as a point of reference for you guys, there is quite a bit of squish in those grips. And those are constructed using a direct injection silicon rubber, very similar to what we see on a lot of other wheels from say Asher Racing, Cube Controls and the like. It's funny how they've kind of gone through a bit of a phase. There was a phase where everybody wanted Alcantara, then leather for a while. And this seems to be the direction that a lot of manufacturers are going now. It has its advantages and disadvantages. One advantage is that it is quite nice and grippy, relatively easy to wipe clean as well compared to say our Alcantara, for example. But it does tend to feel quite clammy and sticky over time if you're driving with bare hands. And you can see it does pick up quite a bit of dust and debris but just one thing to be aware of there. I know it can be a bit of a polarizer. Some people like it, some people hate it. So construction wise, we have a five millimeter thick face plate, which runs throughout the entire wheel. You can see the 6061 aluminum enclosure 
sits around the back here, but it doesn't extend throughout the grips and everything. So the rigidity is actually provided by the carbon fiber itself, and that runs all the way through the grips. Now, if we have a look at the side of the grips here too, you can see where the injection molded is. So that is actually molded onto the carbon fiber as far as I can tell. There's no way for you to remove those grips and replace them with something else should you wish to do so. Now, the advantage of doing it this way, of course, is that you don't have any plastic associated with the construction. So you're not gonna have that creaking noise that you sometimes get a lot of wheels that we've tested, even some more expensive ones. If you twist the wheel like that, you can actually hear the plastic creaking, never gonna be an issue on this wheel. So advantages and disadvantages to the design, the disadvantage, obviously, serviceability, but the advantage being the simplicity and overall look and feel in construction of the wheel. So spinning the wheel back around to the front now, there's actually no plastic anywhere to be seen on the wheels. So all of these little surrounds around the buttons, the buttons themselves, and even the hats on our rotary encoders are all CNC machined aluminium. Even the surround around the LCD itself is machined aluminium as well. So if we grab the Moza FSR, for example, and the brand new Cube Controls CSX3, which I'm very excited to check out very soon. That just came in, so we haven't had a chance to properly review that yet. But you can see both of these wheels have some plastic in their construction. You can see the plastic surround on all of the buttons, as well as the plastic bezel around the screen. I'm not a big fan of that on this new CSX3 wheel compared to their older wheels, but we'll unpack that in the full review of this. And same deal with the Mozzle wheel here as well, plastic surround around the screen. You can see the plastic grips that I was talking about before. Now we didn't have any issues with creaking on this particular example, but I have seen a few people complain about it with these wheels. It has been something that people have complained about on Fnatic wheels as well. Now the CSX3 and the Gomez wheel do come in at around the same kind of price point, whereas the Mozzle wheel is quite a bit cheaper. But just wanted to kind of compare the three of them across here. So you can really sort of see how the Gomez stands out as having no plastic anywhere. It looks more like a wheel that you would find in a real life race car, at least in my opinion, because of that. It just has that quality construction throughout. Nothing's there that doesn't really need to be there. You could potentially inlay the display and not have the shroud here, but everything else just looks really purposeful with this wheel. So metal construction aside, I've grabbed an assortment of some other wheels here so we can do a bit of a comparison in button feel. So starting off with these ones, they've got about a millimeter and a half of travel in them. They do have a nice sort of tactile purposeful feel to them. So they're definitely among the better feeling buttons subjectively, I would say that I've tested. If we compare to something like Cube Controls, this is the F Pro, but all their wheels have the same buttons. Those are a little bit more clicky and you can hear by comparison, they tend to echo throughout the shell, not a vibration or a rattle or anything like that, but they just don't have the same expensive click to them that we get with these guys. If you look at something like an Asher Racing Wheel as well, those are a little bit more squishy and a little bit more positive in their click. I would say that plastic face aside, these probably have a slightly more expensive feel to them overall, but it's very, very close. It's hard to say whether I personally prefer, I, li I like the feeling of the cold metal touch on the Gomez wheel, but I think the Asher buttons are probably a little bit better subjectively for me. And if we compare to obviously a much cheaper wheel like we get with the Fnatic buttons, these have got a lot more movement on the face here, so they do have a tendency to rattle around a little bit sometimes, not on this particular wheel, but you can hear when we push those buttons, you do hear it echo throughout the enclosure and it just doesn't have the same expensive feel in the button presses that you get with something like this Gomez wheel, which obviously you expect with the massive Delta in the price point, but it's important to highlight there. Now, if we talk about the rotary encoders, this is where I was a little bit, or I wouldn't say even a little bit, I was, I was quite disappointed with the feel of these rotary encoders. Now, firstly, it's important to highlight that these do only function as rotary encoders with a push button function. They don't operate as multi-position switches. Now that's important because a lot of sims these days allow you to actually have a button position correlate with a certain setting inside the game. So say for example, you wanna have fuel map number three selected, you would select fuel map three on the switch and it would always correlate with that position. If you're using a rotary encoder, one move equals one click in either direction. So you can imagine you might go from fuel map one through to fuel map three and then exit out of the sim, come back in again later and suddenly this position is now fuel map number one and you're going one, two, three to get to fuel map number three. So I was a little bit disappointed that we didn't have multi-position switch functionality, but what I did notice, and it didn't bother me massively on initial impression, but driving with the wheel over a number of months, I did start to wish that these rotor encoders had a slightly more positive click to them in each position. Now, if you're driving without gloves on, they feel okay, but I did find occasionally they were a little bit too vague for me to really know whether I'd clicked it or not. But yeah, the rotary encoders did leave me a little bit disappointed for the price point. Now this is gonna be a very subjective thing, but one feature which the Cube Controls wheels have, which the Gomez doesn't, 
is backlit buttons, as you see here. And those are completely customizable on their newer wheels. You can choose any color you want. Look, I'm, it's a bit of a take it or leave it thing for me, I'll be honest with you, but I know plenty of people absolutely love this feature. So it's something that is worth calling out. So while we're talking about inputs, let's flip the wheel around, talk about the shifters and analog panels, and then we'll come back around to the front and talk about the RGB LEDs and the screen in a bit more detail. So flipping it around now, you can see machine 6061 aluminum enclosures here, including the arm and the cage. These are using Omron micro switches for the actual detection of the shift. And those are apparently rated to over a million cycles. So they should be relatively reliable. Obviously there are other options on the market which use Hall effect sensors, which are contactless. And those theoretically are a little bit more reliable than a moving part style switch. But the flip side to that is that the circuitry involved in actually driving those is a little bit more complex. They can sometimes require calibration. They can sometimes slip in their calibration while you're driving. And I have had that happen on a couple of cube controls wheels in the past. So these should be relatively reliable. Obviously we'll see how they stand at the test of time, but they are definitely high quality switches in there. So I'm not overly concerned about it. You can see really thick aluminum construction here throughout the cage too. It varies in its thickness, so I can't really give you a measurement, but I'd say at least four millimeters thick at the thinnest point throughout. And there's absolutely no discernible flex there in the shifters whatsoever. You can see the carbon fiber option paddles that we have here. There is the option for aluminum as well, if you wanna go with that. Those are five mil thick, so they're no flex there. They got a really firm click to them with the neodymium magnets, and they are metal to metal contact there. So they are quite loud. They don't include any little rubber pads to dampen that sound, unlike some of the other competitors on the market. So that is worth noting as well. But I think for most people looking at a high-end wheel like this, it's probably not gonna be a huge concern to you. Just something to be aware of if you are driving with somebody trying to sleep in the next room, this may well be the loudest thing on your sim rig. That's the reason why I call it out. No adjustment there in terms of the throw, but look, to be honest with you, with the shape and ergonomics of this wheel, I can't imagine that you would really want to make all that much adjustment anyway. So I don't really see that as being a problem. It's a point of difference for sure compared to some competitors, but I mean, some of the ones that do have adjustments in them, I've had the adjustments slip over time. With the cube controls wheels, a couple of times I've had the little adjustment arms slip, so the shifter suddenly pulls further than it used to. I've had uh, paddles work that way loose and slide in and out before on some other wheels. This, I think, you know, it's pretty much a set and forget type thing. So yeah, no issues at all with the shifters. They're definitely among the better ones that I've felt in my lifetime, as you would expect for the price. And uh, yeah, nothing really to complain about there. So onto the analog paddles. Unlike the micro switches that we have in the shifters, these are using Hall effect sensors, and those can be calibrated in the software as you'll see later on. So a decent amount of throw there at the maximum adjustment. I'd say that's more than likely gonna be enough for anybody wanting to use it as a throttle and brake or handbrake, as opposed to just a clutch. I don't see that being an issue for anybody. You can actually adjust the throw a little bit on these as well, but I don't really see that as being necessary. But yeah, I didn't have any issues at all with these when I was driving. One thing that I did notice about these, which does stand out, is that they do have a really nice progressive feel to them as you pull them in. So they get quite a lot stiffer towards the end of the throw compared to the beginning of the throw, which some other shifters on the market don't have that. They just kind of feel the same throughout. So if you are doing something that relies on muscle memory or really fine control, like throttle and braking, or maybe even handbrake, depending on what you're doing, then I think that these are gonna provide the precision that you need there. I don't drive that way and it's not something that I'm experienced with doing, so I can't really comment on it too much, but yeah, for me, they're definitely among the more communicative paddles, I would say, that I've tested. So yeah, they're good, no issues there at all. So while we're around the back here, let's talk about the USB connection through to the PC. So this wheel is compatible with whatever wheelbase you can mount it to, provided that you can get an adapter which is appropriate. It is a standard 70 millimeter stud pattern as we talked about earlier, and you don't necessarily have to have the 50 mil spacer, you just need to make sure that you have space for the USB connection. So the way this works is you get included the USB coil connector. You can buy these separately if you want to, and that has on one end of it a standard USB-A connection, with a little ferrite choke there as well for EMI reduction. Haven't had any issues with EMI for those who might be wondering. And then on the other end of it, we've got a nice automotive grade screw in type connector here with four pins. That is exactly the same connector as we have on the Asher racing wheels for those who might be wondering. It is a different pin configuration. Now, I've seen a couple of people in the support channel on Discord uh, wondering why their wheel isn't working and it turned out they're actually using an Asher racing cable to plug in. So just be aware of that. Could potentially cause damage if you send five volts down the, uh, down the data lines. So just be careful of that. But that plugs in, it's keyed so it can only go in one way. Screws in like so. And you can see here when it's plugged in, there is about a 60 millimeter 
stem there on the plug, plus you want to add another three or four centimeters for clearance for the cable so it's not bashing up against your um, wheelbase. So that's the reason why you might want to consider the 50 millimeter spacer, as we mentioned earlier, just to make sure you've got enough clearance between your wheel and your wheelbase so the cable isn't going to get snagged and pulled. Because obviously if you're bending that all the time around the end here, it will end up damaging the cable and potentially causing you some reliability issues. But in terms of the cable itself, nice coiled cable there and a really nice solid high quality connection there. So while we're talking about the connection as well, another thing that is really important to understand, and this is one issue that we did run into a couple of times throughout the last few months that I've been using the wheel. The Vocor screen in particular is quite resource hungry. Now, if you have a look at the detail on the back of the wheel here, you can see it's rated at five volts, 500 milliamps supply for the uh, for the USB connection. And that is a standard current rating for a USB connection. What I found, and this is also confirmed by Gomez as well as quite a few people in their, uh, in their Discord channel which have run into similar issues. Uh, if you don't have sufficient power, if you get voltage droop across that power line, what can happen is the display can start to go all funny. It can actually split so you get half the screen on the top and half the screen on the bottom kind of switched up. And if you watch one of our recent racing videos, you would actually seen this happen to me. So the Vocor screen is very voltage sensitive because the bandwidth requirement is so high for the screen and the LEDs combined as well. If you don't have sufficient bandwidth available on your USB interface, that can cause some issues as well. And another thing that did happen to me, and again was in one of my racing videos, is first the screen went all garbled, and then the uh, the rev strip stopped working entirely, and then the entire wheel actually rebooted itself. And I had three or four seconds where the shifters and all the buttons stopped working entirely, and I was stuck in third gear, I think it was going through turn one. Uh, I was actually winning the race at the time as well. It very nearly cost me the race. Now thankfully it did boot up again and was detected straight away so it wasn't an issue, it wasn't a race ruining issue at least, but definitely something to be aware of. So the reason for all these issues is both bandwidth and voltage supply related. So if you don't have sufficient supply voltage under load, if that voltage droops or drops down then that'll cause issues with the screen. The way around that is to use either an active powered USB extension cable or a powered hub and if you don't have sufficient bandwidth that can cause issues as well. Now that was the issue that I had. Power wasn't a problem. I did actually have this plugged into a powered USB hub, but I had quite a few other devices plugged into that same hub. And what happened was the combination of all those different devices all running at once overran the bandwidth available to the USB interface. At least I assume that's what happened because it didn't appear to be a voltage issue and that caused the wheel to go a bit crazy. So the way around it for me was to get an active USB extension cable, plug that directly into my PC, and then all of those issues went away. But it is important that you guys are aware of that because A, not everybody's going to have a spare USB port available on their PC and B, it could be quite a significant extra expense to buy an active cable depending on how far your wheel is away from the PC that's running your SIM. So little things to be aware of there, not necessarily deal breakers, but a couple of little tips and traps that we did run into along through the testing process. So a little bit more detail on the touchscreen Vocor 480 by 800 resolution 4.3 inch display as well as the RGB LED 16 LED strip along the top here. So both of those are basically standalone USB devices. So the RGB strip uses an uh, Arduino board internally that is programmed by the guys at Gomez. So you need to be very careful when you plug this in that you don't accidentally flash a different sketch to it and end up bricking it. It is a proprietary sketch which they've developed which is protected so they're not going to just send that out to you and allow you to flash it back to the board. So be aware of that and it's the exact same Vocor display that you'll see featured in a lot of other standalone dashes and some other wheels that we've tested as well. So the good news with that is that it does allow you to use this display directly with SIM hub, Joel Reel Timing, Z Dashboard for example. I'll take you through some top level stuff in SIM Hub in just a minute, but one thing that I would recommend you guys do is actually download that software. You can run dashes just on your screen on your computer just to sort of get a feel for everything that's possible there. But the really big selling point here is the level of customization that it provides. So unlike with say the Ferrari SF1000 wheel from Thrustmaster or the Mozza FSR wheel that we looked at just recently here on the channel, those have predefined displays or predefined dashes which you can go through, but you can't customize and build your own. Whereas with this, you can literally program, customize, do graphics for anything that you want within SimHub. You can have conditional overlays pop up when you make changes to things like bias or fuel map. Uh, when the pit limit is on, you can have it in a big red display on front of you if you wanted to. There's an endless amount of things you can do, only really limited by your imagination and your skill level when it comes to programming. And there's a massive amount of community support there as well, not only from the team at Gomez, but also 
also the team behind SimHub and of course the users there as well. So you can jump on say Race Department for example and download thousands and thousands of different dashes to try out. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. There's not really a whole lot of quality control there, but uh, Gomez do actually provide as one of the download packages a default screen which gets you up and running which is really great. So you can really make it as complex or as simple as you want to. If you do just want to get up and running out of the box, just download their default profiles and you're pretty much good to go with just a little bit of setup, but we'll run you through that in just a minute. Now with the RGB strip along the top, again, completely customizable, completely programmable. You can have this obviously display the RPMs of the car. You can have it display flags. You can have it display a spotter. So it'll light up on the left when there's a car on the left, for example. Pretty much anything that you can imagine you can do with the LED strip. Now brightness wise, LEDs and screen are both plenty bright enough. There is a little bit of backlight bleed on the display at the higher brightness levels, but not overly so. Uh, the contrast ratio and color reproduction is quite good on this screen as well. So obviously not the same kind of quality as you're gonna get with a $1,500 smartphone, but for what its purpose is, I think it's absolutely fine and adequate. So ergonomically, the wheel is a little bit of a polarizer. Being 310 or 320 millimeter diameter as we measured it, does place it on the wider side of wheels for a formula style wheel. Now the rubber grips have a really nice solid feel to them. They're quite chunky, they're quite thick. That was actually the first thing I noticed when I started driving with the wheel. Very solid, very easy to grip though, but the sheer weight of the wheel combined with the diameter will mean that you get a bit of a dampening effect on some weaker wheel bases. So say for example, if you're driving under say about nine or 10 newton meters, so if you're using a CSL DD, with a, even with a boost pack, you will notice a slight dampening effect on the force feedback. And that's a combination of the extra diameter as well as the weight of this wheel compared to say one of the formula style 270 70 millimeter wheels that you get in the Fnatic ecosystem. So if you are looking at running this on something like one of those wheelbases, then that is definitely something to consider. I don't think it's necessarily gonna be a problem for you, but definitely something that you will notice. The smaller the diameter of the wheel, the more twitchy it tends to feel. Some people like that, some people don't. I actually prefer around a sort of 280 to 300 millimeter wheel for most of my driving. I find that that tends to be the most versatile, but I did find that I adapted to the 310, 320 mil that you have here without too much of an issue. And you guys saw in my racing videos that I was able to get along with that just fine, at least within my skill level. The buttons are very well placed. I can hit those DRS and pit limiter buttons with no issue whatsoever. And remember again, those stickers can be customized. So you can change them to be something else when you order the wheel, should you wish to do so. But yeah, ergonomically it's laid out very well. I do like the little surrounds around the buttons as well that allow you to not accidentally push the button, particularly when you're driving in VR. Those make it quite easy to feel where you are before you actually push the button. But as we mentioned earlier, the reach to the shifters is pretty fine. The paddles on the bottom can be a little bit awkward. Most wheels that we've tested with analog paddles, which are formula style, are a little bit awkward. You can either move your hand around to the side to get the car underway. Not generally something that you're gonna to be touching when you're driving anyway, if you are using it as a clutch, but for a throttle and brake, maybe a little bit tricky. Again, remembering you can adjust the throw on these two paddles, but it is a little bit of a reach there for me. I don't think it's gonna be a problem for anybody. But yeah, ergonomically, very happy with the wheel. I just wish that it had thumb encoders. So boosted media review wouldn't be complete if we didn't take a look inside as well. And I do have high expectations here for build quality. Let's see what we have. I'm just gonna grab a little rag here so I can tuck it between the top and the bottom so we don't do any damage to the wheel. And that way I don't have to be quite so careful with how I'm holding it. But a couple of things that stand out here. So we've got a proprietary PCB here with Gomez Sim Industries stamped on it for the main interface board. You can see the little processor sitting there. USB connection between the Vocor display driver chip there, which is sitting in its own little tiny enclosure. And then a custom proprietary PCB here for the LED strip. Two more custom PCBs for the button interface too. I like the fact that all the buttons are actually interfacing directly onto a PCB rather than having wires flying around all over the place internally. So the only cables that we have here are the USB interface down to the plug at the bottom, the linkage between the motherboard and the RGB LEDs, and then the linkages between the shifters and analog paddles back to the motherboard as well. Good quality soldering jobs on everything that I can see. I can see that they've got a heat shrink on the connector there as well on the back of the pins. And another thing that I notice here as well is that you can see the quick release is bolting directly into this nice thick aluminium enclosure. That looks to be, let's actually measure that for you quickly, four millimeter thick CNC machined aluminium enclosure. And you can see how that 70 millimeter stud pattern literally bolts directly into that. So you will obviously need to be careful if you are using your own bolts to mount your own quick release, that you don't have bolts that are too long. That could definitely cause issues with screwing into and damaging the PCB, probably why included in the box 
was some mounting screws to make sure that that doesn't happen, but just be aware of that for sure. But yeah, absolutely no red flags whatsoever internally. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I'd say that that is the highest quality internals I've ever seen in any sim racing wheel that we've pulled apart here at Boosted Media to test. So uh, yeah, I expected that for the price point and uh, definitely not disappointed. Okay, so the GSI wheel is mounted up on the SimRig via a zero play quick release on our SimiCube 2 Ultimate. Now, obviously, as we talked about earlier, we have a USB dedicated connection here. So the wheel doesn't communicate with the wheelbase directly, meaning that it is compatible with any wheelbase you want to use it on, provided that you can get an appropriate 70 millimeter hub adapter to connect it. So what I want to do now is run you through the basic process for getting this set up and running. We're not going to go into a massive amount of detail here because the instructions are made very, very clear on the website. And there is an awesome level of community support for all of this through their Discord, which we'll look at in just a minute too. But I just wanted to make it clear that the process here is more involved than what you would have with, say, a ecosystem like SimMagic, Moza, Fnatic, uh, you know, Thrustmaster, and so forth, Logitech, for example. All of those are products that you just plug in, and as long as you've got the driver software installed, everything kind of just works out of the box. There are a couple of different elements to making all of this work on your PC. So if we jump onto the Gomez Sim Industry slash support page, the first thing I'm going to highlight here is if we scroll down, there is a link to their Discord server. Now I'm gonna open that up and give you guys a really quick rundown on this because I have relied on this quite heavily. It's pretty much any time, and you, guys, you can see for yourselves here that it's a lively community. Anytime somebody jumps in and asks questions, not only the staff, including Dan Suzuki, who recently announced that he is now a part of the team there, which is really cool. But you know, the guys that are actually owners of these wheels are all really passionate about the product and all jump in here as well. So it's a really well laid out server, lots of community support there. You can also jump in and download a lot of presets as well look at that in just a minute too as we're going through everything but there's even a support ticket thing here where you can open up an official support ticket and get support that way too so i would absolutely recommend getting this even if you're just looking at buying the wheel jump into this discord get a good sense of exactly how things operate and what you can do here but let's close that again for now and go back into the website. So if we scroll back up a little bit from the Discord link here, you can see there's four separate downloads which we need to grab to get this wheel up and running. That is assuming that you're wanting to run this with SimHub. Now you can run it with Z1 dashboard if you wish to do so. I believe you will still need to run SimHub to have the LEDs function, but the display is compatible with Z1 dashboard. Also, Joel Real Timing can be used with this screen as well. It is just a standard Vocore 480 by 800 resolution display. So what I would recommend doing is download all of this software package. You don't even need to own a wheel to experiment with these because most of these can operate as an overlay anyway. So spend some time in SimHub, in uh, Z1 Dashboard and Joel Real Timing and kind of figure out what one is going to suit you best. But we're going to, for the purpose of this video, run through exactly the way they recommend. So we're going to grab the GSI Control Center software, the Display Driver, the SimHub Dash preset and the iRacing DLL file, which is required to make everything work properly with SimHub. We're also going to jump on the SimHub website and make sure we've got that downloaded as well and then simply go through and make sure that you've got all of those installed. Now, if we go over to the quick setup guide, it actually runs you through the exact step-by-step -step process to get everything working here, including configuration in SimHub and so forth. So there's no need for us to go through all of this in today's video. You can see there the configuration for setting up the dual stage clutch point in the GSI control center software too. It is pretty basic software. I'll quickly open it up here so you guys can have a look. That is the actual window overlaid on there screen grab of it so you can see calibration, setup for dual stage clutch, gas and brake configuration there too. So if you do wanna use these mapped as a analog input for whatever function you want, so you could use it as a handbrake if you wanted as well, you can do that. You can set a minimum and maximum dead zone there if you wish to do so, as well as setting our bite point adjustment. You can also switch between left and right paddles for the bite point there too. So you can see at the moment, if I release my left hand, it goes to the predetermined bite point, and then I can release my right hand from there. If I switch those over, then it operates in the opposite direction, which is cool. So pretty basic software, but it does everything you need it to do. So I'm gonna give you a quick rundown on SimHub now, just to give you a general overview of what you can do in the software. Again, I would absolutely recommend download this, have a play around with it for yourself. You don't need to have a wheel to get a sense of how this all works. You can even set up your own custom dashboards uh, ready for when you actually receive your wheel if you wanted to do so as well. So definitely experiment with this, get familiar with it to get a good sense of whether this is something that is for you or not. But SimHub is a massively powerful piece of software. It's definitely up there with my favorite pieces of software. Now SimHub is free to download and use, but it is donation 
Kitchenware, meaning that if you make a donation, it does unlock the full potential of the software. Uh, the main thing is that you're limited in the refresh rate or sample rate that the software operates at if you don't register. But it look, it only costs you a couple of dollars and it is definitely absolutely worth supporting the developer of this software. It's uh, a really massively powerful piece of software that I'm sure you'll find useful in many other ways on top of just what we can do with the wheel. But if we jump across to Dash Studio quickly here, this will give you a quick rundown on the dashboards that are available by default through the software. And all we need to do is just click on the dashboard that we want and then we can put that up on the screen by just clicking on show on generic vocal screen. Obviously this assumes that you've gone through the configuration process which is all covered in the manual so we don't really need to go through it here as well. Now you can see by default here I've got this set up to run the GSI preset which is the one that we downloaded in the earlier step but you can run a massive amount of different displays here. There is a pretty much endless supply and of course you can create your own from scratch as well. You can get in there, do all the coding, do all the visuals, import whatever graphics you want. Massively powerful piece of software. If you do choose a display which has multiple pages like the Bosch DDU8 for example as well. If we've put that up on the screen you can also use the touch screen to tab between the different pages of the display too which is really cool. So if you're driving you want to quickly go between them you can do so. You can also assign buttons to switch between dashes too if you wish to do so but I'm going to go back to the GSI preset here now. And this particular preset has all sorts of contextual graphics which will pop up on the screen over the top of what you're seeing here as a basic layout as well. So one thing that I would really love to see added to SimHub in the future is some way to actually browse through all of the dashes available from the software itself rather than having to go to third party websites to browse through them. But as I said earlier, if you do jump on their Discord, there are a whole bunch of dashes which you can download via the GSI SimHub dashes page. And this goes for LED presets as well. So you can see there's a massive amount of community support here as well as ones that are actually recommended by Gomez themselves. So on the subject of presets, there are also some presets that you're probably gonna to wanna to download for the LED section as well. So if we go across to the uh, RGB LED tab here, you can see here under the profile manager, we've got the default profile, which works for any game, but is a little bit more generic in how it operates. And then I have some dedicated presets here for iRacing, as well as a set of course of competition. So say for example, we load the iRacing preset. You can see all of these little options down here represent all the LEDs that are available. And you can see presets for each individual car, which determines how it operates relative to the selected vehicle inside the game. And if we drill down even further, you can see you've got complete control over all sorts of different scenarios. You can see here, yellow flag on or off. But if we go into the uh, open test data overlay, you can see, for example, if we switch on the pit limiter, we get lights like that. And just to give you an idea of some of the things that we can do here, ABS indicator, traction control, DRS active. You can even use the LEDs as a spotter if you wanted to. So if there's a car on the left, it'll light up on the left and vice versa on the right. Flag indication as well. So black, white, green, yellow, and blue flags. And there you go, there's the car spotter down the bottom there. So really it is an endless amount of things that you can do here because you can do all the coding yourself. You can set this up to do pretty much anything that you want, of course. Now, obviously being so complex, it does make it a little bit more intricate to set up and it does require quite a bit of stuffing around to really get things dialed in and working exactly the way you like them. For example, one of the things that I do find quite frustrating is switching between different cars. You'll often find that the RPM gauge doesn't quite match the vehicle. So you might need to go in through car settings, for example, and actually make some adjustments here to make it all line up perfectly with the car. It really depends on how pedantic you are. Obviously for our racing videos, you wanna have things as close as we possibly can. It may not bother you, but you get a sense here of just how powerful this software is, how much you can do. And obviously with that comes added complexity if you're comparing this to something like a Fnatic or Thrustmaster or Logitech wheel, for example. So as I said before, download the software, have a play around with it for yourself. You don't need to have a wheel to start jumping in and experimenting this. You can just run all of these dashes in a window on your display if you wish to do so, or even as an overlay over the top of your game if you wanted to do that as well. So you can have everything set up exactly how you like it, ready for when your wheel arrives. But let's jump in now and talk more about the driving experience. Okay, so as you guys know, I've been driving with this wheel for a number of months now, which has given me a good general sense overall of what this wheel is like to own and operate long term. So not only from a driving perspective, but just a general ownership perspective. One of the things that I've enjoyed about this wheel just as much as actually driving with it is just really getting in, customizing things and really making this wheel my own. So I think the best way to tackle this in the interest of saving as much time as possible is to just jump straight into the pros and cons based on my experience over the last couple of months. So starting off with the pros, and these are in no particular order, 
massively customizable is the first thing. So your imagination really is the only limit when it comes to the LEDs and the display on this thing. Being able to customize the physical appearance when you order this wheel is really awesome as well. So as you guys know, we customize this entire layout in terms of the button colors, the sticker colors, color combinations, even the labeling. All that stuff can be completely customized on their website when you place your order. And I spent many, many, many hours, more hours than I care to admit, and more hours than my wife would appreciate just going over everything, checking that I'm happy with the stickers, checking that I'm happy with the colors. And that meant that even though we get so many wheels and so much hardware coming through here at Boosted Media, I was genuinely more excited to receive this wheel than I have been for most other sim racing products that I've reviewed at least for the last couple of years. Now, just on a side note to that, I'm sure that a lot of you guys will want to make your own custom designs here. But if you do decide you really like what we've done here, we did actually arrange with our affiliate reseller partner, Advanced Sim Racing, to actually stock some of this exact layout. So if you do really like what you see here and you want to get your hands on one straight away without having to wait for Gomez to build it for you, then that is an option. And we'll put some links down in the description below if you do want to pick one of these up from Advanced Sim Racing. So thank you very much to them for making that possible for those who want to take advantage of it. Now, moving on, uh, 800 by 480 resolution might sound low in comparison to say a smartphone, for example, but in my experience using this, I haven't found the resolution to be a problem at all. As you guys can see here, the text is nice and crisp even the smaller text there, it may start to get a little bit fuzzy if you're really wanting to get in and you know use a leaderboard or something like that with really tiny text. But for the majority of users, I think the resolution is sufficient here. Obviously, the higher the resolution, the more resource hungry things become. We do see some dashes which have higher resolution than this, but generally they will rely on a dedicated HDMI connection rather than USB. And that means that you're taking up valuable resources in terms of graphics on your PC. You may not even have an available HDMI port to even run a dash like that if you're running a triple monitor setup, for example. So I think this is a good balance here between resolution and uh, quality of the display. The display itself is really nice quality as well. There's not too much backlight bleed here, good contrast ratio, good color reproduction, and all those things that are important for the context of what we're seeing here. I think that this display does a really good job in that regard. Next up, as we talked about in the review, I do really like the feeling of these metal buttons. They're a little bit different from a lot of the other wheels that you would have felt in the past. They don't have quite such a defined click to them, but they do do still have a nice intentional sort of press and they don't create any nasty hollow vibration inside the wheel. They just have a really nice metallic feel to them, which I personally really like. They're certainly not the stiffest buttons in the world, but subjectively, I just really like the feel of them. I like the metal feel as well. I like the fact that, you know, if you touch them with uh, with without gloves on, they have that cold metal feeling to them. It just makes it feel that little bit more premium than what you might have experienced with some other sim racing wheels. Unfortunately, same can't be said about the rotary encoders though, and we'll talk about that when we get into the cons in just a minute. So overall, the wheel has excellent ergonomics, although some may not like the bulk and diameter, and we're gonna unpack that a little bit more in the cons as well, but the wheel is very comfortable to hold. The nice thick grips do provide a nice solid feel with or without gloves. All the buttons on the face of the wheel are nice and easily reachable as well. You don't have to roll your hands around too much or take your hands off the wheel to operate them. Although of course you will have to take your hands off to operate the rotary encoders. And I do really wish that this wheel did have some thumb encoders. Shifters have a really great feel to them as well. They are quite loud, but they have a really nice solid click to them. And the five millimeter thick carbon fiber paddles are really nice and solid as well. No discernible flex there, even if I pull on them more than I would ever do in the context of normal driving. So absolutely no issues there whatsoever. The analog paddles have plenty of throw and a nice progressive feel to them too. They do give you a good sense of whereabouts you are within that throw, which means that they will be okay to use as a throttle and brake if you can't use pedals for some reason, but as a dual bite point clutch as well, they work really, really nicely. So overall, just a really nicely presented product with the exception of the rotary encoders, which did disappoint me a little bit. And the wheel just doesn't have that toy-like appearance that a lot of other wheels, even at this price point, do tend to have. And if we have a look at the Cube Control CSX3, for example, which we're gonna be reviewing very soon, just little things like this plastic surround around the display, it just it just looks that little bit toy-like compared to something like this. This just has an appearance more like something that you would find in a real life race car, as opposed to something like this that looks that little bit more toy-like. And of course it is a subjective thing. Some people might really like the appearance of this. And of course we will dig deeper into this when we do our full review in just a little while. But yeah, I just really feel like they've nailed the physical appearance of this wheel. And then lastly on my pros list is the awesome community support, not only from their own staff, but also just the wider community at large. So even though we did run into a few 
few little technical glitches using this wheel. Answers were always quick and easy to find. And even things like setting up the dashes, trying to configure things and really get things dialed into exactly as you like. There's always somebody there in that community discord that can help you and hold your hand through that process, which has been really, really awesome. So having said all that, it isn't the perfect sim racing wheel. And there are a few things on my cons list as well. So let's run through that now, starting with the most obvious, the lack of thumb encoders. This is a no brainer really, doesn't really require any explanation. Some people won't find that they're really necessary, but for me, there's something that I rely on very heavily and something that I absolutely have missed when I started using this wheel over the F Pro from Cube Controls that I was using previously. So there are a lot of things that I prefer about this wheel, don't get me wrong, but I really do wish that it had those thumb encoders. There's plenty of space there available and it's definitely something that I hope we see added in a future version of this wheel. Now on the subject of rotary encoders, we touched on this earlier as well. I was disappointed with the quality of the rotary encoders presented on the face of the wheel here. A couple of little things. Firstly, they do have a bit of a flimsy feel to them. You can see they do have a little bit of sideways action, which would be forgivable on a much cheaper wheel than this. But even comparing to some of the cheaper wheels that we've reviewed in the past, these just don't have quite the same nice feel to them. A little bit of slop there. And while they do have clearly defined detents in each position. They just don't quite have the positive click to them that I would have expected for a wheel at this price point. Again, it may not bother you, you may actually prefer a slightly softer feel, but for me, it was something that did surprise me. I was expecting a little bit more of a positive click in each position here. Now, the other thing here as well is that these don't function as multi-position switches. They are only rotary encoders. That means that the SIM won't know the physical position of the button, only the direction that you've moved it. So one move equals one pulse in either direction. So if you, for example, want to choose engine map number three, and you switch that to position number three, then you exit out of the sim and go back in. Position number three will then become position number one and you have to go another three. So it's not a point of reference. And we do see that functionality on a lot of other wheels, some of which cost a lot less than this does. Now, one other thing that I did notice here as well is that the pulse width isn't adjustable by the user. So what that means is that occasionally if you turn the knob quickly, you may miss a, uh, you may miss a move. So I found that if I was changing fuel maps, occasionally I wouldn't actually make the change that I thought I'd made and I'd wonder what was going on. I have to kind of take my eyes off the road to figure out what had happened. Some other wheels that we've tested do have adjustability for this, so you can fine tune it in and make sure that regardless of how you tend to use the button, it will always function exactly as you want. So again, that is something that may be able to be added in future firmware updates, but one thing that I did miss on this wheel compared to some of the competitors. So next up, we talked in our pros about the massive amount of customizability and functionality that is offered with this wheel. The flip side to that, or the trade-off that comes with that is ease of use. This is a lot more more complex to set up. Now they have done a good job of providing presets that get you up and running at a basic level, but if you really want to get the most out of this wheel, really want to take advantage of everything that this has to offer, it is quite a steep learning curve. Now some people enjoy that process like me. I actually really enjoy getting in there, really learning how everything works and really sort of trying to get in and take advantage of everything that the wheel has to offer. But if you are the sort of person that just wants to plug something in, get up and driving with no learning curve, then this may not be the wheel for you. Now in relation to that as well, the Vocor screen that they use in this wheel and this is also the case for a lot of other dashes that we've tested in the past as well. It is quite a resource hungry piece of kit, both in terms of the power supply and the uh, bandwidth required. So if you're running a hub that doesn't have adequate power or adequate bandwidth available, you may run into some funny glitches. As you saw earlier, we did have some issues with the screen tearing. A couple of times the LED stopped working as well, which isn't related to the screen directly. But because of the amount of bandwidth taken up by the screen, it did cause some other weird glitches. At one point as well, the wheel did completely reboot itself during a race and I lost the ability to shift gears for a couple of seconds. Now, when I ran a dedicated active USB cable back to my PC, all those issues went away. But that is of course an additional expense that you will have to consider. And if your PC is a long way away from your SIM rig, it may create an issue as well, or your PC may not even have an available USB port to run as a dedicated slot for the wheel. Now, in my case, I did try running it with a USB hub, a powered USB hub, and I did still have issues when I had other devices plugged into that. So a dedicated line was necessary for me to get this wheel working. Your experience may vary there, but again, check through the Discord to see how people's experiences have gone with relation to that. Next up, the wheel is definitely on the heavy side for a sim racing wheel. Now that isn't gonna be an issue if you're running a more powerful direct drive wheelbase, but if you're running something like 
like a CSL DD, for example, might not necessarily be a problem, but you will definitely notice a dampening effect in the force feedback when compared to other much lighter wheels on the market. So that's definitely something to consider. I'd say if you're running under about nine or 10 Newton meters, definitely something that is gonna be worth considering there. Now, in relation to that as well, at 320 millimeters diameter, it is a little bit wider than some people might like in a formula wheel that will have a dampening effect on the force feedback as well. So a smaller diameter wheel will feel a little bit more responsive and a little bit more twitchy. It is something that I did adapt to, but I didn't like it when I first started driving with this wheel coming straight from a 280 millimeter wheel. Ultimately, it is subjective, and I'm sure that Gomez have done a ton of research into what diameter most people prefer, and that's probably the reason why they've gone with this. But again, something to be aware of there. Personally, I would prefer a slightly smaller diameter. Now, relating to that as well, the rubber grips are very thick. Personally, that is something that I really like. I think that the wheel is very, very comfortable to hold, and particularly for long sessions, there's no rubbing, there's no kind of blisters formed on your hands or anything like that. One thing that you will want to be aware of, though, is that the rubber grips, as we've seen with a lot of other wheels that utilize a similar design, they are a dust and debris magnet. You can see just in the time that we've been filming this, it's picked up quite a lot of skin cells and yuckiness off my hands. If you're using gloves, it's going to pick up dust off those as well. If you've got a dusty room, then it's just going to generally become quite dirty and gross. Now, being rubber, obviously, that does make it nice and easy to clean. There is a good amount of squish in those grips. But the reason I call it out is I have seen a couple of examples of people that have bought these wheels and really not gotten along with the rubber grips to the point where they've actually ended up selling their wheels and buying something else different. So again, just something to consider, not necessarily a con, but definitely something that is different about this wheel compared to other wheels that we've tested in the past. And then lastly on the cons list is just the fact that this wheel is relying on third-party hardware and software for its functionality. So obviously they're bringing in the Vocor displays to integrate into their design and that is, of course, relying on Vocor's drivers. It is also relying on third-party software in the form of SimHub or Z1 Dashboard, Joel Reel, whatever you end up wanting to run for the display as well. So what that means is that, say, for example, if there's a SimHub update that suddenly breaks the compatibility with Vocor, for example, then you may find that the display isn't gonna work for you. And if you get in touch with Gomez about that problem, all they could really do in that particular scenario is either wait for SimHub to update their functionality or wait for Vocor to release an updated driver or so forth. So not necessarily a problem, but just something to be aware of and something to consider when comparing to a wheel that has a fully integrated ecosystem. So at the end of the day, when all is said and done, I am a big fan of this wheel. It's something that I enjoy and appreciate every single time I jump in and drive. I look forward to using this wheel. The pride of ownership with the wheel is really high as well with the customization that we did. I really love that between the color scheme and even just the dashes and the way the LEDs function, everything on here is exactly the way I personally like it. Now, I did switch back to the GSI dash for this review, but normally I actually do run it with a boosted media logo in the top there just to personalize it that little bit more. And it's just those little things that you can do with a wheel like this that do add that personal touch and make it something that you'll appreciate every single time you jump in. It will continue to be a wheel that I'll choose to use a lot of the time. And while there are a couple of things that I hope they do upgrade for a future version of the wheel, really happy with the wheel overall. Now we of course do have a massive variety of other sim racing wheel and associated hardware reviews over at boostedmedia.net as well as right here on this very YouTube channel. So I would definitely recommend checking those out as well. That'll give you a good point of reference for some of the other wheels that you might want to consider as well if you're looking at something around this price point. We do of course have the upcoming review of the new Cube Control CSX3 as well, which I'm really excited to check out in more detail. This just arrived the other day, so I haven't had a lot of time with it yet, but there are a few things about this which I'm really excited to check out, particularly in comparison with some of their older models and some of the changes that they've made over previous ones. So definitely make sure that you're subscribed so you don't miss out on that review. And uh, yeah, guys, thank you very much for watching. Leave a thumbs up if you've enjoyed today's video. Let us know down in the comments below as well if you do own one of these, what's your experience been like? Is there anything that you've noticed in addition to the things that we've covered today or have we highlighted the things that were issues for us that haven't been an issue for you? A lot of the value in any review video comes from you guys commenting down below so we really do appreciate that but above all thank you very much for watching today guys and we will see you again very soon bye